Hello everyone. As a baby boomer and for the people since, and I believe also for at least two generations before mine, was marriage oversold to us? I can remember a song uh, back in the early 70s. The song says, Love, titled Love Can Make You Happy, um, sung by a group named Mercy, became uh, popular on the radio. Uh, the song was written by Jack Sigler Jr. and it was done in a very sweet and a uh, very optimistic way, very gentle way too. Fit, fitted the times at that time. That's the way which a lot of people were speaking. And the course that song went, love can make you happy if you find someone who cares to give a lifetime to you and who has a love to share. Can, love can make you happy. And I also remember uh, back from the early 70s, uh, uh, Group Chicago had a song called Just You and Me seem to be talking about an escapism into just you and me topia, a utopia of just you and me. And a lot of people look to marriage as a source of their happiness and the spouse as a source of their happiness. And my question is, are those expectations exaggerated a lot? I think that uh, uh, from what I know of many people um, in my family and my friends who've been married for many years, yeah, um, they do find a great deal of satisfaction and happiness with their family. Uh, but I think the expectations are exaggerated a lot of times and that uh, they disappoint people uh, many times. Uh, situations start out well in this world and they often go sour. And when this happens, uh, sometimes it's difficult to pick up the pieces and see what happened, try to uh, work through the situation. But a lot of times people turn around and trash the situation which disappointed them. And so we come to this one verse at the end of Hebrews. Short verse at the end of the book of, book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 4. It's actually a pretty good summary of the scriptural teaching on sex and marriage. The apostle, whoever we wrote, whoever wrote Hebrews, we don't know for sure. I think it might have been Paul. Uh, I think there's a good chance. But it's an outline of the emphasis of the teaching of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the way that the church should be teaching. Emphasis is necessary today, too, that we should base our ideas about marriage and sexuality upon the scriptures rightly interpreted. And what comes from God himself is eternally valid and gives guidance uh, when we have so many different uh, opinions and rationalizations, human beings, of their conduct, and so forth, and we... So if this person believes that, this person, what am I going to do? Well, we're to, called to make biblically based choices. And the teaching ministry of the church, the preaching ministry of the church and the family is to have the responsibility to guide people, to make right choices according to the word of God, first of all. And this is what the Hebrews 13, 4 says, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So, first of all, believers in Christ must honor marriage. The institution itself, that's what it's talking about here, held in honor. The issue here is to come to a Christ-like honor and respect for what God has created, God has instituted and continues to uphold. And this type of honor is neither idolatry of marriage, putting it as a God itself to be worshipped and, and subserved, but in rather treating it as something which God has created, God has put before us, and we are to honor because it comes from him, not as a God in itself, not as something that we worship as will give us happiness if we uh, go aside into that and make marriage our God nor escapism. Escapism is a kind of idolatry here also. Escape from our situation, escape from an unhappy family, escape from our own insecurities, escape into marriage, expect the spouse to understand, to uphold, and keep us. So I think um, a lot of people have said how about how we put too much of a burden upon marriage nowadays, which I think is entirely possible. Um, so let's take a look at what this would mean. Honoring marriage would demonstrate submission to the God who created mankind and instituted marriage. 
It's ultimately an issue of lordship, of loyalty to God himself. Marriage should be honored by all. And this is given here in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews written to Jewish believers who are under some deep trials to forsake Christ or forsake their Christian uh, heritage and, and shrink back into just doing the things of Judaism because they uh, would have experienced much less persecution in that time. And along with that, that would have come a temptation to go to a more lax view of divorce, perhaps even that going to the temptations of sexual immorality in the pagan culture around them. They were reminded of the truth of the scripture they knew, because again, these are Jewish believers who have been raised from their very uh, childhood to understand God as the true source of marriage, that God put it there in Genesis chapter 2, and it's a divine and not a human institution. And by the time this was written, um, there was kind of a grudging tolerance of the Old Testament to polygamy. It pretty much had died out after, except among the royal family, uh, apparently in, um, in Jerusalem by the time of uh, uh, Solomon or so, definitely by the time of the exile, when, when the uh, Jews were exiled to Babylon. Polygamy had pretty much died out. There was pretty much exclusive monogamy among the Jews by the time of Jesus. And there were there were exceptions. Even there were people who had serial divorces, divorce, uh, marriage, divorce, marriage, divorce, and that's the situation Jesus was speaking to. And the depraved family of Herod the Great. Oh yeah, you can uh, see how depraved his family was as far as marriage goes. But normally, what was expected there was pretty much exclusive exclusive lifetime monogamy among the Jews, man and woman married for a lifetime. And uh, one of the reasons we do know that polygamy did die out was uh, it became more and more a heavy burden for a man to support more than one wife. Financial, yeah, but um, more or less uh, normal normal marriages uh, were not, they weren't polygamous, they were um, looking for uh, more than one man or woman, but they this became the basis of the family, the model for natural human love and fairly strong families too. Um, Judaism at that time, fairly strong families. And uh, so the apostle, wh whichever apostle it was, when he says, let marriage be held in honor by all, he's bringing them back to honor something which they had known from their childhood and called to honor by the church as a whole and by individual believers. And this comes to us today through the word of God. And in the church of Jesus Christ, yeah, we're called to honor marriage as an institution. It means holding the scriptural teaching about marriage, first of all. Teaching what the Word of God says and the preaching and teaching of the church in Sunday school. And uh, we do have have had a lot of number of specialists and experts who talk about marriage. A lot of these people are uh, psychologists. And um, we need to have their teaching corrected where it's not supported by the Word of God, by the Word of God. So we need to do this in our churches to support what the Word of God says. This means teaching married people what the Word of God says, how to follow the Word of God in their marriages. And those who are unmarried, um, the best preparation uh, to make right and godly choices is to uh, for them to hear what the Word of God says, understand it, and to be able to make the right choices, to understand the right choices, and to follow them. Honor for marriage, above all, I believe, means that being the most Christ-like person you can be before marriage and in marriage. The basic ingredients for marital success are there in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, etc. So, we're to do all this teaching in the context of Christ-like love within the church and the family. This teaching isn't to be delivered. We're called to love one another, speak the truth in love, to, to teach each other, not in hard demands, not in rigid demands, but in loving one another. Uh, some of that sweetness and gentleness, about, which uh, was in that song which I first quoted, My Mercy, Love Can Make You Happy. Um, I think that... Uh, when we speak to each other about marriage, 
Um, we could use some of that. Not religious expectations, not trying to push people, but just simply to let people know what God's word says. And as we go into the traditional marriage vows in English, the ones which uh, came about through the Book of Common Prayer, Thomas Cranmer uh, came up with those, I believe, originally. They were talking about love, joy, peace, um, promises to love, honor, obey, love, etc., cherish, etc. Uh, it's a saying in a realistic depiction of marriage, the commitment of marriage from Scripture. And this is God's expectation that belongs to God. A uh, Christian author by the name of Larry Christensen said, uh, marriage belongs to God. A marriage that belongs to us will suffer at the hands of selfishness and immaturity and even sheer impulse and whim. So that's where a lot of suffering in marriages come from. People, selfish, immature, impulsive, and whim and go out on whims. They don't really realize what it is they're messing with and when they mess with a marriage because it belongs to us, but it belongs to God, responsibility entrusted by God. So, what happened? Well, there was a great worldwide war in, and in the United States a lot of people seem to be casting off the Protestant ethic of sex only within marriage. Venereal disease seemed to be on the rise. Uh, drinking while music and dancing seemed to be inflaming the passions of young people and they got into marijuana and cocaine and pop psychology made it seem as if virginity and chastity were unnatural and sexual urges should be indulged from early adolescence and going on there was more blatant sexuality and nudity in literature art and movies and pornography moved without the restrictions that it faced earlier and unmarried Mothers no longer faced social ostracism, divorces rose, and ministers of all denominations began to deplore and denounce what was happening. I'm not describing the 1960s here. There was a first sexual revolution in 1920s. You ever hear about flappers? 1920s, there was a first rev sexual revolution that happened then. And the Great Depression pretty much put an end to that, and uh, at least until the 1950s. And, um, it did seem to come back from some of the same same sources, some, some of the same disappointed people uh, came back and started a second sec sexual revolution, which seems to have still continued today in the 1960s, although you even do find hints of that in the 1950s. So historically cultures have had swings between denouncing and rationalizing marriage, sexual immorality, upholding or degrading marriage. The Church of Jesus has the scriptures, though. We've got a constant standard of marriage and sexual morality based on the Word of God. And each swing of the culture, the choice has been set before the Church, its leaders, to always make clear the scriptural standards of sex and marriage. And sex, honor and respect for marriage will mean more serious consideration before marriage. Yeah, understanding the seriousness of the choice. And... Sometimes people do get uh, carried away, away by the emotions, by the dreams and stuff. And as someone who's uh, performed marriages, yeah, sometimes you do have to uh, deal with them to make sure that they, un you know, that the couple is coming to be married does understand what this will entail, and to, to make sure that they take the commitment of marriage most seriously, because God takes it seriously. That's a vow that's made before God, and this makes marriage worth thoughtful preparation not just running off and doing it sometimes people do beat the odds and get manage to get married but usually it happens that people who uh, didn't prepare who uh, may have been immoral etc before marriage um, they beat the odds and often you find especially if they're christians that they really had to come to a deep repentance toward themselves towards god and toward their spouse and towards the others in their lives that uh, may have been hurt by their lifestyle before they got marriage. So marriage is worth also something worth fighting for, for respect as God's institution in the midst of a world that may not support it. So honor to marriage means honor and protection for what God has reserved only for marriage also. 
Honor to marriage means protection for sex only within marriage between a man and a woman. The issue is though that of Christ-like purity. For those who claim to know Christ as Lord, Christ-like purity means adherence to God's standard of sex only within marriage. The Lordship of Christ includes one's sexual life also. It isn't just something that involves going to church, raising your hands, uh, singing in the uh, repeating some words you hear, listening to a sermon, it means also following Jesus with your sexual life also. This is what the apostle goes on to say after he talks about marriage being held in honor by all. Let the marriage bed be kept, be undefiled, be kept pure, as another translation puts it. Talking about marital sex here. There's a scriptural modesty in describing marital sex. Modesty of reverence and respect, not of shame. Sex is not something for shame. It's not considered to be sin in itself. It's not considered in Scripture itself to have been the sin of Adam and Eve. There um, came about uh, sometime in the medieval era that um, I believe uh, primarily within, within the Catholic Church that sex was the sin of the Garden of Eden. No, no. Sex was there in the Garden of Eden, but it was not sinful. Sin came from the eating of the, of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, whatever that was. We don't know precisely what kind of tree that was, but that's the way Scripture presents how sin entered into our world. And you find uh, there's a message, uh, uh, which I did earlier, on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 on reciprocity, reciprocity of marriage relations. Very perfect. Frank in, script, in Scripture, the Apostle Paul talked about himself. He may not have been married himself, but he's saying, uh, give to each other yourselves. And uh, uh, this, in matter-of-fact way, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 23, talks about modesty of the body. It's just kind of a, kind of a given. And then you go on in the Scriptures to see the rapturous joy of marital passion in the Song of Solomon. That's where seduction is supposed to take place. Spouse to spouse, spouse to spouse, um, building each other up, getting each other ready, and having a passion there. And Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 21, talks about the natural care and of the body, of our bodies treating ourselves. There's no dirtiness, no shame in the scriptural view of the body and sexuality. But there's modesty, protection, respect, and submission to God, trusting in Him, following His Word, just as Christ Himself. And as we look at the summary of all the, the teachings of Scripture, we can see that really all sexual expectations and activity are to be confined to marriage. Um, this protects lines of personal modesty and sexual chastity, uh, visual, physical intimacy, and uh, scriptural prohibition of living together for marriage right here that's uh, as a kind of a trial marriage. Uh, even Jordan Peterson says that, um, you know, you're not a car that you're trying out. That that's a trial marriage is really um, a contradiction in terms of, and people who live together before marriage is kind of a trial marriage. Most of the time, guys see that just simply as easy access to sex, even if the woman looks at that as being a next step on the, next, the way to marriage. But, uh, um, we need to see sexuality as be waiting for marriage, not as a part of dating, courtship, or entertainment, even to entertainment, but as a part, something that God has desired for marriage, and the marriage bed be undefiled, marriage bed kept pure. Historically, the problem hasn't been the eras which Biblical standards of sexuality have been held up. There's a Puritan era, yeah, in the 1600s to the 1700s, and even into the 1800s with the Methodist revival, you find biblical standards of sexuality being held up. Those have generally been good for the people and the families that they've been in. But what happens to to um, describe to our to defile to bring up about this so false mysticism? The medieval church started to uh, call sex itself as being somehow less than God's best for a person. It started upholding virginity instead of 
sex within marriage between man and woman as being perfectly acceptable. False mysticism. And the Victorian era um, liberal church 1960s fell into junk science and psychobabble, going back all the way to guys like uh, Sigmund Freud and Wilhelm Reich, which uh, started to give permission to s sex and weakening the adherence to biblical standards, even in the lives of professed believers and in even in the, the churches, the mainline churches throughout those years, which uh, uh, people would attend church and be part of the social group, um, but they really didn't have a a firm commitment to Christ and I can say that I do know that a lot of the people in those churches uh, were having affairs with each other so um, the word basically here summarizing is don't give your innocence purity dignity and honor away for mo momentary pleasure save it for your future wife or husband your wife or husband is one who deserves it will cherish it forever and Jordan Peterson, you know, quoting him again, there's a place, I, a quote from him, he says, there's no such thing as casual sex. There's nothing casual about sex itself. So, the God who commands purity has also provided the power for purity throughout his son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We're men and women. If we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we got the power of salvation, the power for holiness in all aspects of our lives. We don't have to say that we can't help ourselves because God has given us power greater than the urges of our physical body and our, our emotional life, um, our desire to uh, go into uh, things as to escape, to uh, seek to follow others. God has given us power for sexual purity in the Holy Spirit, in our mind, in our emotions, in our intentions, to be faithful in all circumstances. We don't always take take a responsibility and seek God's strength and power. And, we're, and that's the power to say no when we're confronted with temptation. And that's the power to find joy and love in God's will. But we need to come back and remind ourselves what Romans 6 says, we are dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. And going on this way means uh, let the marriage bed be undefiled. It means looking and finding love in all the right places through God and Jesus Christ, looking for it with fellow believers, in marriage and the family, and finding also the love of fellow believers, not a love which will be indulged in a sexual way, but certainly in a godly friendship, agape love also self-sacrificially. If we truly follow Jesus, we're going to love one another as Christ has loved us. And we'll find we'll have a heart that's filled with the love of God through the Holy Spirit that will pour out not just from awareness of how we're loved by the cross, but to love one another in the church, marriage, church, and the family. And so that... Uh, there's no need for escape there. Rather, we'll find a safe haven, a secure base to build a marriage, a life in Christ. So, adherence to God's standards also means strong, firm, and compassionate declaration of the consequences of breaking those standards. The last part of the verse uh, de deals with uh, the third part of this. Do honor to marriage means also do respect for the consequences of sex outside of marriage. The issue of Christ-like firmness about the ultimate consequences, we see this here. The judgment of God against sin also includes judgment of sexual sin. Those who Christ, call Christ Lord and Master also know his reality of judge of all mankind. He's Savior, Lord, and Judge of all. And they'll respect his word regarding the consequences of disregarding his will. Disregarding his will comes into judgment, where God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. It's a reminder that sexual activity outside of marriage has the consequence not of human disapproval, not because we're going to have a bunch of um, dried up old biddies in the church looking down on us and, and clucking about us, but divine disapproval and judgment. And this extends right here the sexual the seventh commandment 
thou shalt not commit adultery to all sexual activity outside of marriage. And this reminds us adultery, sexual immorality, isn't the sexuality that God designed, but the sexuality of hell itself. So, the scriptural emphasis on the consequences of sexual activity outside of marriage is necessary today. The ultimate problem is, isn't just the health consequences. We heard about that in the 1980s with why wait, and those are real, legitimate reasons not to have sex outside of marriage. Uh, venereal disease, pregnancy are the big ones. Every time we find a medical treatment for any of those or preventative, it becomes a fresh excuse for immorality in our culture. And even for people who claim to know G Jesus to say, well, I'm going to go do that because it's okay now. They're not going to have a disease or a pregnancy as a result of that. But the responsibility here is for a just and holy God to follow his moral laws and to that includes our sexual life and the consequences if these are not followed. Marriage in itself doesn't often change the habits of someone who has not changed his or her standards the word of God does. That's something which I remind people of before marriage, that if your standards aren't the word of God right here, they're not going to be changed by marriage. Remember that the traditional vows contain the promise and pr before God and to the spouse, forsake all others for the marriage, and that includes sexually. And that would include emotional affairs also, but uh, yeah, forsaking all others. And that would mean also no polyamory. Um, that could be a remedy for boredom, some promotion. Um, we see through websites, magazines, uh, um, some sort, sort of apps, um, nah. And uh, I've also heard some uh, excuses for a double standard on adultery promoted by uh, that high-class men can have this outlook for their ap sexual appetite and some royalty nobility in the past. Some people who thought they're um, rich people uh, thought that they could go outside their marriage to uh, quench their and indulge their sexual appetites and women who weren't their wives and it was really a kind of a weird uh, pattern of uh, affairs and adultery among European nobility and sometimes people here in the United States looked at it and said well they're doing it why can't I do it so that's what we call um, an overreaction something which we're not to go go into because of what God says, God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. And if we and go back to uh, John Lennon's weird song about uh, instant karma is going to get you, um, we may not see the consequences entirely in this life. But the people that we see who have gone into this, Hefnerism, Hugh Hefner, and uh, his uh, Hugh Hefner's weird leer, and uh, um, the way in which uh, some people from the pickup artists seem to be going into sexual addiction, the influence of evolutionary psychology, the manosphere, red pill movement, um, where people seem to think that, yeah, um, I can get married as a man and go and cheat on my wife or a woman who says, I can follow this uh, polyamory and we can ha have a... Uh, uh, men in addition to my husband follow this the open marriage type of thing well right here if you're a believer in Jesus Christ enough said God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous and there are also mental and spiritual consequences as well uh, there is a letter uh, from a girl named Julie that went to the Christian leader Dick Purnell and she said that she had spent some time as a strong, joyful, and trusting believer in Christ. But then she started dating an attractive unbeliever. Yeah, I can remember that back in college that uh, uh, sometimes there were Christian girls who were fairly attractive themselves, but uh, they often walked over three or four decent Christian men, attractive Christian men, to go after 
the attractive unbeliever, and they, she fell to hit, and they would fall to sexual advances, just like the, uh, Julie did. She said she fell to his sexual advances through loneliness. Well, I don't know, but she said instead of getting closer to God, I got closer to Neil. I am sinning. I don't know what to do. I love Neil very, very much, but I want to come back to God. I know I should break up with Neil, but I can't. It seems I can't live without him. I can't love people anymore. I can't forgive. I can't stop lying. I can't read the Bible. I just can't be a Christian anymore. And many, many times, I think, when people talk about deconstructing, that's exactly where it starts. That's, a lot of time it's been a trace of that. The people start turning away from God sexually before they uh, def before they officially and publicly leave off their faith. And it, God does provide the way to hold on to him. Uh, again, I'm bringing up Dick Purnell. He had a six-month, 22-nation journey at one point as a Christian leader. And in Manila, in the Philippines, he found himself on a night that he was weary and lonely, approached by a gorgeous woman she grabbed his hand and said, I'd like to give you a good time. Why don't we go to my apartment and have some fun? He was both attracted and repulsed. And he uh, had a moment of struggle as she continued to try to uh, entice him. But, and she, he pushed her off. And finally she asked why. And he said, because I believe in Jesus Christ. And went on stronger to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I am a Christian. My God is real, and this is wrong. He is a holy God above. And at that point, they ran from each other. He went to his hotel motel room with uh, on his knees with tears and thanked God for the strength and for the power in the name of Jesus, for the courage to resist. The Joseph Maneuver, turning around and running from temptation. Not to sit there and toy, running away. Since judgment upon sexual sin is a divine prerogative here, it guides us to have a true balance of moral firmness and Christ-like compassion. We can say sexual sin is wrong. God will judge. And yet there's all, the, the ability to offer forgiveness and faithfulness to God. For anyone that's fallen, no matter how many times, there is a chance for a fresh start, a new purity through faith in Jesus Christ. We're not to go, me too, to the world. Me too, to the world apart from Christ. Follow what the world has done, what they what they say. Or we're not to live with judgmentalism and suspicion, even with, upon those who are seeking with all their hearts to follow Christ, his standards in their lives. One of the strange things I've found as a Christian man is that uh, how many people, sometimes women, try to look at, and see if there's some sort of chink in my armor or to see if there's something from my past they can take and I don't doubt that these people would have held my head up figuratively speaking in triumph if they had found some way in which I had fallen that it meant some sort of victory for them if there was some way in which I had fallen which they could exploit to try to give me a bad name shame on you Shame on you. We stand with each other. We try to hold each other up. We try to help each other grow. And we don't try to find chinks in others' armors, places which they may have been fallen, that we can. We don't do that. We help others and we act in mercy, not judgmentalism and suspicion. And if anyone falls, we treat them with mercy and forgiveness with the love of Christ. We don't stand above them as if we're um, Perseus holding a head of Medusa or for the weird statue Medusa holding a head of Perseus we don't do that so marriage is the ultimate human natural love relationship on earth it is given to us by God he instituted it and the proper perspective on it as the ultimate love relationship on this earth one which is supposed to take us from youth to death it's part of what we're, part of our creation, part of what God has given to us. And proper perspective comes when we come into the ultimate love relationship with God through Jesus Christ then. Betrayal of the spouse means betrayal of God. 
the growth in the in loving God, following God means growth in our ability to be able to stand in a strong marriage, a loving marriage, and be able to show the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. It's not going to happen without um, some some people will fall. Sometimes marriages will go sour, but uh, the witness of a marriage dedicated to Christ, where people are coming back and keeping faithful to each other, even when there are times when they may not feel loved each other, which may feel disgust, maybe even hate them for things that they did, but turn their head around in love. Again, forgiveness. Yeah. God honors that perseverance. So, first of all, for unmarried adults and parents whose children are marriageable age, this means proper preparation for marriage and a protection of sexual purity. For those who are married, this means growing in your marriage, protection of your own faithfulness. For unmarried teenagers and adults, make a commitment of your future to God in prayer and build over time a scriptural image of that godly marriage partner and seek that your family would support you, give guidance and consideration in discussion of a godly manner of dating and courtship. Open, loving discussion. Figuring out this thing. Working it out for yourself. Not as some sort of edicts from on high from someone else's experience and desires, but to seek to follow the Word of God for yourselves to understand what this means. If you're a married couple, part of a married couple, marry a man or woman who's married, commit your marriage to God. Grow in your own walk with the Lord and with each other. And if, for both married and unmarried people, protect your mind, protect your body against the sexuality of hair. The temptation comes through the thought life, first of all. And we need to be careful what literature we read, what entertainment we watch, and what situations we're in. And for those who've committed sexual sins, means receiving God's forgiveness, His power to live a pure life. No sin can be hidden from God, but through God we can find forgiveness. And no sin can be hidden from Him, but we can deceive ourselves too. We can deceive others, make others for a while think that we're better than we are but if we have sin confess him before God first of all confess to him and receive his power his forgiveness reprogram your mind through the word of God and this calls us also as believers and for churches to be a truly loving fellowship to fulfill the genuine needs of love of our of our members and it calls for us to teach wisely, compassionately, and lovingly the scriptural standards. And wise, compassionate, discipline, and rebuke where the standards are violated. But still, all to show mercy, not to stand in the case, in the stand upon other believers as if we are the judge of their sexuality. God is the one who is that, the judge. And the final thing is to Make sure that you know, first of all, Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior to have your need of eternal salvation met first of all. Come to faith in Christ. Trust in Him. Tell Him that you repent of your sins and you're putting your trust in Him for your eternal salvation. So I hope this helps and God bless you and I hope to be able to speak to you another time upon other topics, other scriptures.